Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Giovanni Reeds, House of the Scorpion, Chapter 8. Welcome to the new channel. And now, without really any ado, let's begin. Chapter 8, The Idiot in the Dry Field. Matt was wildly excited. Not only were they going on a picnic, but they would travel by horseback. Matt had seen horses from the windows of the little house, and of course he had seen them on TV. Cowboys and big, tough banditos rode them. His favorite hero was El La Tigro Negro, the Black Whip. El La Tigro Negro was on TV every Saturday. He wore a black mask and rescued poor people from evil capitalists. <laughs> His favorite weapon was a long whip in which he could peel an apple while it was still on a tree. Matt was more than a little disappointed when Tamlin brought out a sleepy gray horse instead of the spirited steed El La Tigro Negro rode. Be reasonable, lad, said the bodyguard, tightening his girths on the saddle. We're after reliability, not speed. El Patron wouldn't take it if you fell off and were dumped on your head. Once Matt was perched on the saddle in front of Tamlin, he forgot about all his disappointment. He was riding. He was high in the air, swaying along with the smell of ho along with the smell of the horse around him. He felt the coarse hair of the mane pressed against his ankles and against the warm coat of the animal. After all those months of that talking, Matt couldn't wait to catch up. He chatted, up, chatted about everything he saw. The blue sky, the birds, the flies buzzing around the horse's ears. Tamlin didn't stop him. He grunted occasionally to show he was listening and directed the horse along the dirt path. They plodded through the poppy fields and gradually moved away from the big house towards the gray-brown hills that lay on the horizon. The first fields, were in ca the first fields they encountered were covered with a mist of new leaves. These were seedlings. Matt had watched the growing cycle from the window of the little house, and he knew wh what to expect. The older plants were larger and rounder, like small cabbages. The leaves were tinged with blue. As they rode, the plants began became larger as they were high as the belly of the horse. Buds opened into crinkled petals and a glory of white under the hot sun. A faint perfume hung in the air. They came to the fields where the petals had fallen. These lay in drifts all over the ground, while the seed pods they left behind stuck up like little green thumbs. The pods had swelled until they were the size of a hen's eggs and ready for harvest. Matt saw the first farm laborers. He'd observed them before, but Celia had warned him to hide from strangers, so he hadn't watched them closely. Now he saw that both men and women wore tan uniforms and wide straw hats. They walked slowly, bending down with tiny knives to slash the pods. Why are they doing that? Matt asked. To release the opium, replied Tamlin. The sap oozes out and hardens overnight. In the morning, the workers scrape it off. They can collect from the same plant four or five times. On and on the horse plodded. The field shimmered with heat, and a sweet odor with something rotten at its core filled the air. The workers bent and slashed, bent and slashed in a hypnotic rhythm. They didn't speak. They didn't even wipe the sweat off their faces. Don't get, that get tired, Matt asked. Oh, aye, they do, said Tamlin. The last horse came to a deserted field. The plants were beginning to dry. A hot breeze rattled in the leaves. Look, there's a man lying on the ground, cried Matt. Tamlin halted the horse and got down. Stay, he ordered the animal. Matt clung tightly to the mane. He didn't feel at all safe so far off the ground. Tamlin strode over to the man, belt down, and felt his neck. He shook his head and returned. Can't we, can't we help him, faltered Matt. It's too late for that poor soul, grunted the bodyguard. What about the doctor? I told you it's too late. You want to get your ears cleaned? Tamlin hoisted, Tamlin hoisted himself on the back onto the saddle and ordered the horse to go on. Matt looked back, tears st stinging his eyes. The man was quick quickly hidden by the poppy plants. Why was it too late? Matt wondered. The man must be terribly hot, laying as he was in full sun. Why couldn't they stop and give him water? Matt knew they had water. He could hear it sloshing in Tamlin's backpack. We could go back, Matt, Matt began again. Damn it! roared the bodyguard. He halted the horse and sat for a moment, breathing hard. Matt looked at the ground and wondered whether he had the nerve to jump off if Tamlin really lost his temper. I forget kids your age don't know anything, said Tamlin. The man is dead. Heat or lack of water killed him. The cleanup crews at the end of the day will find him. The horse moved on. Matt had even more questions now. He was un too unsure if Tamlin's temper to ask them. 
Why hadn't the man gone home when he got sick? Why had the other worker why hadn't the other workers helped him? Why was he being left out there like a piece of trash? All the while they were riding along the range of hills that bordered the fields. Now they turned off into a dry steam bed stream bed that led into the hills. Tamlin got down in the hill and led the horse under a cliff, where it would have shade. Nearby was a trough and a pump, which he worked vigorously to bring up the water. The horse was sweating. Its eyes watched the trough, but it didn't move. Drink, said Tamlin. The horse trotted forward and dripped its mu dipped its muzzle. It blew noisy bubbles as it drank ravenously. We'll walk the rest of the way. Can't we take the horse, said Matt, looking doubtfully. It wouldn't obey. It's programmed to stay on the farm. I don't understand. It's a safe horse, which means it has an implant in its head. It won't bolt or jump. It won't even drink unless you tell it to. Matt dis digested that idea for a moment. Not even if it's very thirsty. It was thirsty just now. If I hadn't told it to drink, it would have stood in front of the trough until it died. Stay, he told the horse. Shouldering a backpack, he started up the dry steam. Stream. Matt scrambled after him. At first, the way wasn't difficult, but soon it was blocked by boulders and they had to climb. Matt wasn't used to exercise, but he quickly found himself out of breath. He didn't stop, though, because he was afraid Tamlin would leave him behind. Finally, the bodyguard heard him gasping and turned back. He hunted through the backpack. Here, drink some water. Have a bit of beef jerky, too. The salt would do you good. Matt devoured the beef jerky. It tasted wonderful. Not much farther, laddie. You're doing very well for a hothouse plant. They came to a giant boulder that seemed to block the trail until Matt saw a round hole in the middle. It was worn smooth like the hole in a donut. Tamlin climbed through and reached back to help Matt. The scene on the other side was completely unexpected. Creosote bushes and Palo Verde trees framed a small, narrow valley, and in the center of this was a pool of water. At the far end, Matt saw an enormous grapevine sprawled over a man, man sprawled over man-made trails. In the water itself, Matt saw shoals of little brown fish that darted away from his shadow. This is what you'd call an oasis, said Tamlin, throwing down his backpack and taking out food for a picnic. Not bad, eh? Not bad, agreed Matt, accepting a sandwich. I found this place years ago when I first started working for El Patron. The Alacrans don't know about it. If they did, they'd run a pipe here and take out all the water. I hope I can count on you to keep a secret. Matt nodded his mouth full of sandwich. Don't tell Maria, either. She can't help blabbing. Okay, said Matt, proud that Tamlin considered him responsible enough to keep a secret. I brought you here for two reasons, said the bodyguard. One, because it's nice, and two, because I want to tell you about tell you a few things without being spied on. Matt looked up, surprised. You never know who's listened to you in that house. You're too young to understand much, and I wouldn't say anything if you weren't a real, if you were a real boy. Tamlin tossed breadcrumbs into the pool. The fish rose to the surface to feed, but sir, a clone, he went on. He went on. You haven't got anyone to explain things to you. You're alone in a way real humans can't understand. Even orphans can look at pictures and say, that's me man, that's me da. Am I a machine? Matt blurted out. Machine? Oh no. Then how was I made? Tamlin laughed. If you're a real boy, I'd tell you to ask your big brother that tricky little question. Well, lad, the best way to describe is this. A long, long time ago, some doctors took a piece of skin from El Patron. They froze it so it would keep. Then about eight years ago, they took a bit of that skin and grew it into a whole new El Patron. They had to start at the beginning with a baby. That was you. That was me, Matt asked. It was. So I'm just a piece of skin? Now I've gone and upset you, said Tamlin. The skin was what you might call a photograph. All the information were there to grow a real copy. Skin, hair, bones, and brain. A real man. You're exactly like El Patron was when he was seven years old. Matt looked down at his toes. That's all he was. A photograph. They put that piece of skin into a special kind of cow. You grew inside, and when the time came, you were born. Only, of course, you didn't have a father or mother. Tom said I was puked up by a cow, said Matt. Tomlin's a filthy little pustule, said Tamlin. And so is the rest of that family. If you quote me, I'll deny it. He brought out a bag of trail mix and passed it to Matt. To continue, being a clone, you're different than a lot of people, and a lot of people are afraid of you. They hate me, Matt said simply. Aye, some do. Tamlin stood up and stretched his big muscles. 
He paced back and forth on the sand while having their picnic. He hated to sit for too long. But some love you. I'm speaking of Maria and of course Celia. And El Patron. And El Patron. Ah, uh, well, El Patron's a special case. To be honest, there is a number of people who love you as small and the number of hate you as large. They can't get around the fact that you're a clone. It makes it hard to send you to school. I know. Matt thought bitterly of Maria. If she really loved him, she'd take him w with her and not care about what the other kids felt. El Patron. El Patron insists that you be educated and live nearly as possible. As nearly as possible a normal life. The problem is, no private teacher wants to teach a clone, and so the Alicrans got an Egypt. Matt was startled. He'd heard that word so often, mostly from Maria. He'd thought it was only a swear word, like dum dum or cootie face. An Egypt is a person or animal with an implant in its head, said Tamlin. Like the horse, said Matt with a terrible thought, as a terrible thought occurred to him. Correct. Egypts can only do simple things. They pick up fruit or sweep floors or receive seen harvest opium. The farm workers are idiots, cried Matt. That's why they work without resting until the foreman orders them to stop and why they don't drink water unless someone tells them to. Matt's thoughts were whirling. If the horse could stand there and die if in front of a trough of water, then the man... The man, he said out loud. You're bright as a button, lad, said Tamlin. The man we saw on the ground probably lagged behind the other workers and didn't hear the foreman tell them to stop. He might have worked all night, getting thirstier and thirstier. Stop, shrilled Matt. He covered his ears. This was horrible. He didn't want to know any more. Tamlin was at his side at once. That's enough lessons for one day. We're on a pic and picnic and we haven't had any fun yet. Come on, I'll show you a beehive and a coyote den. Everything lives around water in the desert. They spent the rest of the day exploring the burrows, the crevices, the hidden layers of the sacred valley. Tamlin might not have gone to school for too long, but he knew a great deal about nature. He taught Matt to sit still and wait for things to come to him. He to told him how the mood of a beehive by its hum. He pointed out droppings and tracks and bone fragments. Finally, as shadows began to fill up the oasis, Tamlin helped Matt climb through the hole in the rock and return to the horse. It was waiting exactly where they'd left it. Tamlin ordered it to take another drink of water before they set off. The fields were empty, and the long shadows of the hills flowed across the land. Where they ended, the late afternoon sun made the poppies glow with a golden light. They passed the dry field where the man's body had lain, but it was gone. Teacher was an idiot, said Matt, breaking the silence. She was one of the brighter ones, said Tamlin. Even so, all she could do was one lesson over and over. Will she come back? No, the bodyguard said. They'll put her to work mending curtains or peeling potatoes. Let's talk about something more cheerful. Could you teach me? asked Matt. Tamlin let out a bellow of genuine laughter. I could if you wanted to learn how to break discs with karate chops. I reckon you'll do your schooling off the TV. I'll be around to hang you, hang you out the windows by your ankles if you don't study. <laughs> and that's why Tamlin's one of my favorite characters in this book. But regardless, that is the end of chapter 8. Thank you all for listening, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow when I upload chapter 9.